I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Gary Steinberg, who's here from the University of Chicago. Gary, it's nice to have you with us. Thank you very much. And I'm thrilled to uh, be participating in this outstanding program. It's uh, uh, going to be a, a great educational experience. We've got some super outstanding uh, speakers who are uh, experts in their field who I think are going to shed some uh, very important um, information and light on this uh, important topic. Our first two speakers are going to be <clears throat> uh, Dr. Kareem Chamey, who is an assistant professor of urology at uh, UCLA uh, in uh, Los Angeles. Our other speaker in the first go-round is going to be Alan Weiser, who is a professor in the Department of uh, uh, Urology at the University of Michigan. Well, I'm absolutely honored to uh, give a brief introduction um, going over the definition epidemiology staging and diagnosis for patients with upper tract urothelial carcinoma. When I talk about uh, upper tract urothelial carcinoma, I'd, I'd like to first back up and talk about urothelial carcinoma. Now, urothelial carcinoma is a cancer that it can occur anywhere uh, from the inner linings of the kidney, down the ureter, in the bladder, and down the urethra. Now, most of the time, patients often assume that bladder cancer is urothelial carcinoma. Now it's true, about 92% of all urothelial carcinomas occur in the bladder, but about 7 to 8% of urothelial carcinomas can occur in the upper lining of the kidney, which we call the calyx and renal pelvis. It could occur in the ureter, or it could occur in the urethra. Now, how common is uh, urothelial carcinoma? Now it's uh, Every year we diagnose 79,000 new cases. Um, and when we talk about incidents, these are new cases. Um, and 60,000 of them occur in men, 19,000 occur in women. Uh, approximately 17,000 patients die every year from urothelial carcinoma. 12,000 of those are men and 5,000 in women. The good news for women is that the incidence, which is the number of new cases being diagnosed, and the number of deaths due to urothelial carcinoma have actually decreased over the recent years. For men, the incidence, the number of new cases has decreased, but the deaths have stabilized. Part of that may be attributed to um, uh, you know, fruition of uh, prior smoking uh, uh, tobacco use that's come of age. Um, urothelial carcinoma accounts for 5% of all new cancers in the United States. It's the fourth most common cancer in men, but less common in women. Now, when we talk about upper tract urothelial carcinoma, uh, the mean age, mean, which means the average age of a patient diagnosed, it's 73 years. 3% of the time it can occur in both upper tracts, meaning it can occur in both ureters or both renal pelvis. 17% uh, of the time it occurs concurrently with bladder cancer. Now that's a little different than what we'll all be talking about uh, in a minute uh, as far as ascending tumors and descending tumors. Ascending tumors occur when patients have tumors in the bladder and ascend up into the ureter or renal pelvis. If you look at all patients that have bladder cancer, 2 to 4% of those patients will develop upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Now if patients actually have carcinoma in situ, which is a high-grade tumor in the bladder, 20 to 25% of those patients will develop upper tract urothelial carcinoma if you follow these patients out to 10 years. Now, descending tumors are tumors that occur in the renal pelvis or in the calyx or in the ureters, and it actually seeds down into the bladder. And for those patients, we find that 22 to 47% of those patients will develop bladder cancer sometime down, down in the future. I just want to reiterate for the audience that the, the numbers that Dr. Chamey is are speaking about includes all urothelial cancers. So the incidence numbers that he spoke about is majority of those patients have bladder cancer and do not have upper tract disease, but uh, he's including 
all of those patients uh, 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 that have urothelial cancer, again, predominantly bladder cancer, but as, as Dr. Chambers pointed out, there are a significant number of patients that also have the same type of cancer that they had in the bladder that they also can have in the upper tracts. Now, as far as staging, what do I mean by staging? Um, staging is just a level of invasion. Now, 56% uh, of patients that are diagnosed with upper tract urothelial carcinoma are diagnosed with non-muscle invasive upper tract urothelial carcinoma. And then 44% of patients diagnosed with upper tract urothelial carcinoma are diagnosed with invasive or more locally advanced or metastatic upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Let me kind of go over a brief depiction of what, what I mean by staging. So a stage zero or stage TA or TIS is a tumor that is just involving the mucosa, this yellow lining um, on the top. Now, in, when we see these tumors in the real world, it's not yellow, but this is just a, a depiction here. Um, this occurs in 31% of patients with upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Stage one occurs in 25% of patients, and that is when the tumor not only invades the mucosa, but the lamina propria. The lamina propria is a basement membrane, and there are some lymphatics and blood supply there where the tumor, if, if it sits there long enough or if it's aggressive, may actually spread. Now we're talking about muscle invasive upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Again, these tumors not only invade the mucosa, not only invade the lamina propria, but they also invade the muscle lining of the ureter or the renal pelvis. This occurs in 14% of patients. And in stage three cancers, this occurs in 24% of patients. It involves the mucosa, the lamina propria, the muscle. Um, in the kidney, it can actually uh, grow from the renal pelvis into the kidney or the fat around the renal pelvis or ureter. Now, stage four, bladder, uh, stage four upper tract urethral carcinoma can involve surrounding organs or if it spreads to uh, lymph nodes in the lung or in the retroperitoneum, it would also be considered locally advanced or stage four upper tract urethral carcinoma. This occurs in about 6% of patients. Now, oftentimes you'll hear the words low grade and high grade. Now, when we talked about stage, um, that tells us the level of invasion. But when we talk about grade, we're talking about the aggressiveness of the tumor. Now, oftentimes they go hand in hand. Less aggressive tumors um, tend to have a lower risk of invading, but not necessarily. Sometimes patients may have less aggressive tumors, but if they sit there long enough, they will gain the capacity to invade. Meanwhile, you may have high-grade tumors, which are very aggressive, but, it, but if it's caught early, it may be non-invasive. Um, as far as low-grade and high-grade, upper tract urothelial carcinomas 35% of the time have low-grade, which means non-aggressive tumors, and 65% of the times are high-grade, which, which tells us they're aggressive. Now, how we define aggressiveness is based on a pathologist who looks at the tumor under the microscope. And you can see on the left-hand side, it looks more frondular, looks like um, a, a leaf, um, and it looks more organized on the bottom. But as you start going from left to right, you'll notice it starts to look more disorganized, less homogeneous, it starts to look ugly. And so that's why we call it high grade, because it looks un ugly under the microscope and these cells are rapidly dividing. Now, what are some of the signs and symptoms for patients with upper tract urothelial carcinoma? So most common is blood in the urine. Now, not always do you have to see it with your own eyes. Sometimes it's picked up by having an abnormal urine test um, on a routine urine analysis. Your, your, your primary care physician may note some blood in the urine. Oftentimes, um, patients may be assumed to have urinary tract infections. If there are bacteria growing, um, if, you're, if patients are having symptoms, that may be the case. However, um, it is not uncommon that patients have been treated with antibiotics in the past that may actually harbor tumors in the upper tract or um, in the bladder. 
20 to 40 percent of the time patients may have flank pain. This occurs because patients actually have a little bit of bleeding from uh, the tumor which then obstructs the kidney, acts almost like a kidney stone and may cause symptoms and that's how we may pick it up in about a third of patients. Or if the tumor is very locally, if it's locally advanced, it may um, grow large enough where we can actually palpate and feel the mass in the flank. Now, if patients are actually having severe symptoms, oftentimes that may be due to the fact that the cancer has already metastasized. So if patients actually have symptoms such as anorexia, uh, you know, not, not having much of an appetite, weight loss, fatigue, malaise, fevers, night sweats, that may indicate that the tumor has, may, may have spread to other places. Now, what are some of the risk factors for upper tract urothelial carcinoma? We know tobacco increases your chance of getting all urothelial carcinoma, not just the upper tract. And if patients are two to three times uh, as at increased risk of developing urothelial carcinoma. Occupational exposures, such as aniline dyes, Balkan endemic nephropathy. These are patients um, that are born or grew up in, in the Balkans, uh, so Croatia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Romania. They've been exposed to a certain type of plant, which is often um, used um, with wheat to make bread, but it's European birthwort and um, uh, increases their chance of not only renal failure, but increases their chance of actually getting uh, upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Some, some actually use that same herb to make some of these Chinese herbs and Chinese medicines. Um, arsenic exposure. Now, uh, arsenic exposure is, um, uh, is, is quite high in places like uh, Taiwan or in Bangladesh, but, um, but you, it may also be elevated in, in, in Canada or the upper northwest. Genetics. And when, when we talk about genetics, we talk about Lynch syndrome. Uh, patients with Lynn syndrome have an increased chance of developing uh, upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Um, Lynch syndrome is one of the most common inherited cancer syndromes. Um, urothelial carcinoma is the third most common type of cancer of that syndrome, the most common being colon cancer. Um, we, we, we estimate that 21% of patients with upper tract urothelial carcinoma may in fact have Lynch syndrome. And we tend to, to identify uh, these patients as um, being high risk, uh, meaning uh, women, younger age of onset, finding tumors in the ureter, or having bilateral disease. These, the, um, these patients tend to have, um, it's a little uncommon. That's why we think that may be associated with the syndrome, because we often think that patients who develop urothelial carcinoma tend to be men who are older, who may have tumors in the renal pelvis. So all these oddities tend to point to a Lynch syndrome. Um, so patients who, who have a family history um, or tissue uh, confirmation may actually, um, in fact, be proved to have the disease. Now, how do we diagnose upper tract urothelial carcinoma? The most common test that we use is a CT urogram. And on the uh, top right-hand corner, you'll see a CAT scan. Um, you'll see a red circle around uh, the left kidney and specifically around the left renal pelvis. You'll see the white. The white is the contrast that is flowing from the kidney out the ureter. And you'll see this black uh, filling defect. That is a very um, sensitive and specific test for upper tract urothelial carcinoma. If patients have uh, impaired renal function, they may not be able to tolerate the contrast dye from a CT scan. In those instances, patients may benefit from getting an MR urogram, which is just as sensitive and specific as a CT urogram. Moreover, if, if patients um, may have a pacemaker or they have, and they have renal insufficiency, uh, the diagnosis may be made by a retrograde pilogram. A retrograde pilogram is where a urologist takes a patient to the operating room and under cystoscopy places a very small catheter into the ureter and squirts some contrast, which then fills up the collecting system. And in an area that doesn't fill up, here you'll see that filling defect. 
that I'm pointing to on the bottom uh, image, you'll see that is a sign that's suggestive of a uh, urethelial carcinoma. Now, if a patient's being taken to the operating room, the urologist may at that point uh, place a small scope up the ureter, visualize the tumor, and biopsy it all in one setting. Now, we also diagnose upper tract urothelial carcinoma with uh, something called a urine cytology. This is a very specific test. Um, basically, it's kind of like a pap smear, but instead of the cervix, it's of the urinary um, system. And we take some cells, and a pathologist looks under, or cytopathologist looks under the microscope and tells us that these are cancerous cells that are coming from the urinary system. It's not a very sensitive test, but it is a specific test. And obviously, the, the most definitive approach of diagnosis and, and at least biopsying an upper tract urethelial tumor is with something we call ureteroscopy. That means using a camera and a very small scope to go and look at the ureter and the renal pelvis. Um, you'll see the scope here on the bottom image. It's a very small tube that goes through the urethra into the bladder and up the ureter. Here uh, you'll see two uh, images of a tumor. One is a, a solitary tumor here on the left, and on the right you'll see a multifocal tumor. almost looks like a carpet rug pattern occupying the uh, renal pelvis. The urologist at that point may biopsy this tumor. The urologist may use a, a basket or may use a laser fiber to uh, take a snippet of some of this tumor and send it off to the pathologist to look under the microscope. 